Okay, so next we're going to talk about some more insidious forms of, of threats to validity, things that are harder to see. Um, there's not any easy statistical fix for these things. Um, there's no way to just make sure the thing you're measuring is, is capturing the, the outcome that you want. Um, these are often hidden threats to validity. Um, and these are all uh, what we call threats to internal validity or the, the, the validity of the study itself. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of these. Um, what I have here on this slide does not include all of them. Um, there are whole textbooks that are dedicated to just threats to validity, and the textbooks focus mostly on internal validity just because it's, it's a really tricky, sticky world of, of things to be con concerned about. Um, so what we're going to talk about are some general categories of internal validity issues. Um, the first is a, this idea of omitted variable bias, or where you have selection and attrition um, that will distort your findings and bias your results. And we'll, we'll show examples of all of these as we go. Um, so this is just kind of the overview, and then we'll talk about selection and attrition, et cetera, uh, more in depth. Um, you have issues with trends. Um, where you might see maturation or secular trends or seasonal trends. You might see testing issues and regression to the mean issues. Um, there might be issue with study calibration, um, where you'll, you're not measuring stuff correctly. Um, this is different from construct validity, where the thing that you're trying to measure is capturing your concept. This is like the thing you're measuring, you're measuring it wrong, and there are issues with your actual recording of the numbers. Um, the time frame of conducting the study could be wrong. And then finally, we have contamination issues, um, where you have Hawthorne effects and John Henry effects and spillovers and intervening events. So all of these things can are external things that can distort um, your results and bias your findings. So we'll talk about each of these um, in this next section here um, and how you can potentially fix them. And so we'll structure it as here's what selection effects are, here's how you can potentially fix it, and we'll go through each of these. So selection is this idea that if people can choose to enroll in a program or in a study, um, then the people who do enroll are going to be fundamentally different from the people who do not enroll. Um, so if you're trying to study the effect of Medicaid on poverty, for instance, um, the people who sign up for Medicaid are going to be fundamentally different than the people who do not sign up for Medicaid. Um, the people who enroll in a medical trial are voluntarily are going to be different than those who do not volunteer to enroll in a medical trial. Um, because often the people who purposely seek out programs um, need them and want them. And people who don't seek them out don't care. And so there's something about the wanting of the program um, that is going to confound um, uh, and distort the, the effect. Um, it, the program might help those people more than the people who don't care. Um, and so how do you fix this? There's no easy way to fix it with just observational data. Um, the easiest way to fix it is to randomize people into treatment and control groups. And you find a whole bunch of people um, who are potentially interested in the program, randomize them, have some of them do it, have some of them not do it, and then um, measure the difference. And then there's your average treatment effect. Um, and so that's kind of the, the easy fix to selection bias issues is randomization. Um, but when we're talking about observational data, this does not happen. Um, and so what we'll learn about in the second half of the class when we talk about more specific um, statistical models um, like regression discontinuity or difference in difference designs um, or instrumental variables, all of these things are designed to essentially address selection and address um, the reasons why people participate in a program and don't participate in a program. Um, DAGs also help with this, drawing the, um, the relationship between participation in the program and the actual outcomes. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to, to make sure those relationships are encoded in the causal graph, and then you can adjust for different variables. Um, so there are statsy ways of taking care of this, um, but easiest way is just randomize. Um, there's some other selection issues. Um, if people can choose when to enroll in a program, then time might influence the result. Um, and so if you have a specific type of policy or program that people can, can participate in, some people are going to delay participation in that um, based on their own personal circumstances. And then if you try to measure people um, just out in the world, you might get people before they've participated in the program because they're holding out and you might get people who have already participated in the program and they've done it already 
Um, and it's really hard to compare those two people because, again, there's something fundamentally different about them. Um, one's eventually going to use the program and is just waiting. You might find somebody that hasn't done the program, but they have no intention of doing it. And so they're going to be different from the waiters and they're going to be different from the already users. And so it's really tricky to detect that. Um, so how do you fix that? Um, so one way to do this is if you have some sort of time-based um, program or outcome that you care about, is you can shift time around. Um, and instead of relying on exact age, you can kind of do relative age. So a good example of this is this paper here um, from the Journal of Socioeconomics a few years ago, um, where they were trying to answer this question of, does marriage make people happy or do happy people get married? Um, and so what they're trying to do is um, study the impact of marriage on happiness. The tricky part about that is they can't randomly assign people to get married and randomly assign people to not get married. There's self-selection here. Um, people who get married are fundamentally different than people who do not ever get married. And there's something, there's some underlying confounding variables in the background that help determine that. And so that's really tricky. Um, and so what they find is, is this interesting effect here. They, they study three different groups of people. They study single people. They study people who get married early in life and people who get married or get married later in life. So if you look at this, you can see these three different trends. Um, this upper trend are the people who got married young. Um, these people got married later. And then this bottom level here are the people who never got married. And what they find, if you just initially look at this, it looks like people who get married young are happier. It's up here at the top. Um, people who get married later in life are sad and then they get happy. And people who are never married um, are kind of just sad in general all the time. Um, or they remain single. And so they have lower satisfaction with life, which is the variable here on the y-axis. And so what they're trying to discover in this paper is this gap right here does getting married um, kind of eliminate this gap here? So if people are getting married kind of early on, notice how um, these getting married later in life people in their late 30s here, that kind of goes back up and it erases that gap. And so what they want to see is, um, are people getting married in order to gain that bump or are people losing happiness be after that bump? Um, but it's really tricky because you have these three different groups at three different times and they're all fundamentally different from each other. So one way they address this is instead of looking at age, um, they shift everything around and so they look at the relative number of years before and after people get married. And what they find for both of the, the early marriage groups and the late marriage groups is um, if you shift them around so they have kind of the same time at, at year zero when they get married, um, they have the same average trends before and after marriage where they have higher life satisfaction, they get married, hooray, and then life satisfaction goes back to where it was um, years before they were married. So there is kind of a marriage bump that happens and then it kind of comes back down to kind of this level of homeostasis or just regular levels of happiness. Um, and so that kind of gives evidence that there is kind of a happiness bump that you get and then it goes down. Um, but you can find those that, that bump across these different groups because um, you were able to kind of reshift everything around so it's centered at zero, um, which makes it more studyable. Um, and it helps get rid of some of the selection effects based on time. Um, here. There's still issues with um, comparing these people with the never married people um, because you can't have a zero time for the never married people because they never got married. Um, but it does kind of make other groups more comparable. It's a way of, of getting around selection effects um, and selection bias. So another issue you have with internal validity is um, attrition, which is another tricky thing. Um, if people are participating in your study and then they kind of drop out after a while, um, if you have a study that you want to, to follow up every six months with different people that are participating in your program, and after two check-ins, a whole bunch of people stop showing up, um, then that could be bad. Um, because if the people who are leaving the study are doing it not just because of random, like they get a job in a different city and move, but because something in the program is making them drop out, um, then the effect that you'll find will be wrong and it will be biased. Um, so one way of, of fixing this or addressing this is you want to check the characteristics of those who stay and those who leave. 
um, which is tricky because that means you need to find the people who left and study them, um, which is hard because they've left. Um, but if you can keep track of them fairly well, then you can see if there's any patterns um, that might explain why some people leave the program and some people don't. And so if you can see that there's no relationship between any of your measurable characteristics and people are just kind of randomly dropping out, then you can arguably make us or tell a story that attrition is not an issue. But if um, a specific subgroup of your population is dropping out and others aren't, then that's going to be really bad for your results. And it's going to bias them and um, pose threats to internal validity. Um, so an example of this is if we look at this fake microfinance program that I just made up here with five different people participating in it. Um, if you see um, with this column here, these last two people didn't stay in the program. They, they left um, for whatever reason. So if we calculate the average treatment effect with the attriters, that's the official name for people who leave the program. Um, so if we somehow knew the, the increase in income that came to these people, we could track them down later and figure out what the, what the average treatment effect is. The average here, based on the increase in income, is $2.20. But if we can't track down the attriters and we just have rows one, two, and three, that's all we have left because four and five disappeared, and so we say, oh, we can still figure out the average here. So you figure out the average of these first three rows. That average treatment effect is going to be $2.83, which is higher than the true average treatment effect that we found before. And it's higher and it's biased because we're missing people. Um, so what we need to do is do some sort of statistical tests to see if people or person four and person five are different than persons one, two, and three, if there's something about them that explains why they may have left the program. And then we can try to kind of isolate that bias and figure out why they left. And then there are some ways of statistically taking care of that. Um, but it's something to pay attention to. Um, you generally want the people in your study to stay in your study. Um, and so do all that you can to make them stay, give them good incentives, make it clear that they are helping the cause of science, um, make it so that they want to keep participating. Um, otherwise, you're going to have high attrition and then your results will be wrong and that will be bad. Um, some other issues that you have with internal validity are trend-based issues. And so these, um, these right here with the attrition and selection, that's more of omitted variable bias. There's things that we're not measuring that are impacting the relationship between treatment and outcome. Um, but we can also have trend issues. So maturation um, is this idea that people in your treatment group and your control group will just naturally develop and naturally get better. Um, a really good example of this is with like childhood development, um, any sort of childhood development. Um, kids grow up. And so if you're measuring something like speech acquisition um, and language acquisition in a whole bunch of like kids under five, generally by the time kids hit five, they've acquired speech. And so if you're trying to measure the impact of some program um, or some intervention on like three-year-olds and then you measure them like three years later, both your treatment and your control groups are going to be basically the same at that point because kids just grow up. Um, and so what you have to do is figure out some way to measure that effect um, and remove the effect of or isolate the effect of the program itself or the intervention, isolate that from the fact that kids just naturally grow. Um, and that's hard. Um, one way of fixing that is to use a comparison group to remove the trend. So if you have a treatment and a control group, um, you can see how the control group is growing and developing over time. And then that's your trend. And you can remove that trend from your treatment group. And then whatever effect is left is potentially the effect of the program itself. Um, this happens in, in studies. Um, there's this really cool study here that shows that Sesame Street um, has improved school readiness over decades. Um, but it was really tricky for them to study this because kids develop skills. Um, this was studying the effect of Sesame Street on um, kindergarten preparedness. Um, and so figuring out if students could read and write and recognize letters and colors and other things. Um, and it's hard if you like kind of the naive way of st setting up the study is you say, um, expo like, take a group of 200 kids, expose 100 of them randomly to Sesame Street for a year when they're four have them go into kindergarten and then take a test at the end and see how well they do, and then take another group of 100 people and don't show them Sesame Street, have them go to kindergarten and take a test at the end, 
um, most of the kids at the end are going to basically be the same because you learn colors in kindergarten. That's a thing you do. Um, and so you have to figure out some fancy way to isolate the effect of Sesame Street from the fact that kids just learn stuff. Um, and this study, they did that. They, they found all sorts of like cool ways of isolating um, the effect of Sesame Street. One way they did it was um, by measuring, um, they essentially created treatment and control groups, not through randomization, but through a natural experiment. Um, back in the 70s, as um, public television was rolled out, it was not rolled out equally. Um, certain areas of the country got um, big TV antennas and broadcasting equipment before others. And so some parts of the country were exposed to Sesame Street earlier than other parts of the country. And so what researchers were able to do was look at that and see kind of the staggered rollout of Sesame Street. And then they could essentially have treatment and control groups. And they could see that the treatment groups were the, the parts of the country that got Sesame Street early. Um, the control groups didn't have Sesame Street at that time. And so what was the effect of Sesame Street on kindergarten preparedness? And they found all sorts of cool effects. Um, but the only way that worked is by essentially creating a treatment and control group so that you could remove that trend that comes from just kids learning colors. Um, and so that's something you should be worried about if you have any sort of program um, dealing with kids um, or students um, or even you all. Um, you are taking this class. You are learning stuff. Um, you're, if, if we did like a, an impact evaluation of the Georgia State MPA program or MPP program, that's tricky because you're all taking classes and you're all learning and maturing and growing and um, we have to somehow isolate or remove that trend so that we can see the effect of a specific intervention or a specific program. Um, and that's tricky. The only way to do that is if you can have some control group that you can compare um, the treatment group to to remove that trend. Um, there are also other trend issues. There's this idea of secular trends. This has nothing to do with like the opposite of sacred. Um, this is secular meaning like um, there's kind of periodic issues or kind of other issues out in the world. Um, this is something like recessions. Um, those happen periodically. Um, there's a COVID-19 recession slash depression right now. Um, if you're trying to study the effect of some policy on something, um, the COVID-19 recession is going to distort that, but it's gonna distort it all across the board. Um, and so that's something you need to take into account. Um, this also happens with general cultural shifts. Um, a good example of this is marriage equality. So in 2015, prior to the Supreme Court legalizing um, gay marriage throughout the entire country, some states had legalized it and others hadn't. And so some economists and social scientists had been studying the effect of the legalization of gay marriage on a whole bunch of different outcomes, um, on child mental health, on um, spouse, mental health, a whole bunch of other things. Um, and they were able to essentially create treatment and control groups, compare states that had legalized gay marriage with states that didn't. And so they had kind of justifiably okay treatment and control groups, and that was great. And then in 2015, it became legal nationwide and it wiped out control groups. Um, and so it, it kind of distorted the studies here because of these broader trends in society. Um, so ways of, of fixing that, um, again, use some sort of comparison group, some sort of control group, um, if you can. In the case of marriage equality, it, it wiped out a whole bunch of control groups, which was um, bad for the sake of science, great for like equality, um, but it messed up studies. Um, but who cares about that? Um, so again, the, the way we're fixing all of these trend issues here is essentially just using some sort of comparison group to remove that trend. Um, there are also seasonal trends where patterns might just happen because of the uh, cyclicality that you see in data. Um, and one way of fixing this is you could have a control group or a, a comparison group, or you can make sure the observations that you're looking at come from the same time period, or you can average out any differences that you see. So a good example of this um, is sales, retail sales in the United States, for whatever reason, the most popular uh, season, the most popular quarter in the year for selling stuff is the fourth quarter, um, because that's when Christmas is. And so most retail stores have very few sales in quarters one, two, and three, and they make all of their sales in the final quarter. So if you're trying to do some sort of program to see, um, can we boost 
consumer sales or retail sales and consumer consumption, um, and you happen to run your study, you do a before and after study, and you do um, the before group in like September, and then the after group in like October, October is counted as the fourth quarter. And so you're going to see a huge impact of your program. But really, that's just because of a seasonal trend. The fourth quarter has higher um, sales. Um, another example of this is charitable donations. It follows the same pattern as retail sales. Um, so this is this shows charitable giving by month for 2017 here. Um, so the percentage here is just the percent of donations given in that month for that year. So this all adds up to 100%. And so on average, basically every month gets about 7% of donations. Um, June gets... Um, eight, neat. Um, but by the time you get to December, that's like 18% of all donations happen in December. Um, because again, this is kind of the end of the um, annual year. Um, so for tax purposes, you want to make lots of donations. Um, and so people do that. And so if you have some program, you're a nonprofit program manager, and you want to boost donations, and you do a before and after randomized control trial, and you, you start in the last week of November, and then you end in the first week of December, um, you're gonna see a huge effect, and you're gonna say, we need to roll this out nationwide, this is the greatest program ever. Um, really, your program probably didn't do anything. That's just the nature of charitable donations. It just went up because of seasonality. Um, and so you need to do statsy things to eliminate seasonality when you're, in, when you're analyzing this. Um, or you can um, compare November to November and make sure all of your, your, the months that you're focusing on are the same months or the same seasons or the same time periods so that you don't pick up seasonal trends instead of um, actual trends. Um, some other issues that we have with internal validity is this idea of testing. Um, as people get exposed to a test instrument or questions or tasks, they get better at it just naturally. Um, this is the whole idea of like testing rats in mazes um, that scientists or the like biologists do is they stick a, ma or a rat in a maze and have it go through and then they put it back in the maze and it gets faster and faster and faster because it's learning. We do the same thing with like testing. Um, and so if you have like a pre-test and a post-test and it's the same test and maybe you have like three different stages of the test, you want to see if the program is improving performance a, a, over like a three month span. And so you're going to give them a test every month. They're going to get better at the test just because they've seen it more. Um, and so that can distort your results because maybe they're scoring higher on the test, not because they're learning anything or because the program's having an effect, but because they're just getting better at taking the test. So how do you fix this? Um, change the test every time. Don't give the same test. Um, that's tricky because then you have some validity issues with, um, you have to make sure the test is measuring the same thing each time period, um, which is tricky. Um, you could randomly distribute different forms of the test maybe, and that could kind of um, wipe out some of the bias, but again, that's tricky. Um, you could potentially not offer pretests, but then that's hard because um, then you don't have a, a pre number, a baseline number that you can work with. Um, or you can use a control group that receives the test. Um, that So you can kind of compare baseline results um, on this test. And so that way the control group gets the pretest and then the, the treatment group gets the, the after test. As long as you have everything randomly assigned and, and you're comfortable with that, that's one way of doing it. Um, but it, it's tricky. There's no good solution to fixing testing issues. Um, there's also this idea of regression to the mean, which is really tricky to, to deal with. This is the idea that if you're measuring people with extreme values, um, really high values or really low values, there's a tendency for those values to go back to normal um, over time. Having a really a bad string of, or a really long string of bad luck or good luck is uncommon. And so eventually you're gonna go back to kind of whatever the normal is. Um, an example of this is um, with uh, flipping a coin. If you flip a coin a whole bunch of times and write down every time there's a heads or a tails, um, it's going to kind of oscillate between maybe like three heads and then a tail or four heads and a tail. Um, you might start getting like five or six or seven or eight or nine heads and you're going to be like, whoa, this is awesome. And then it's going to switch back to tails because that having eight heads in a row is possible, but it's statistically unlikely that probability is fairly low. And so if you have that string of good luck, it's eventually going to end. Um, 
And so luck will eventually go away um, because kind of these these random ex or these extreme values are um, rarer. Um, this also happens with like um, cr trends in crime or trends in terrorism. If you see a string of a whole bunch of terrorist attacks or, or murders in a city is like, oh no, we're, we have this crime spree. That's probably just a string of bad luck and it's going to go back down naturally. Um, you see this in sports too. There's this idea of the hot hand effect, where if you see a basketball player making basket after basket after basket, the commentators will be like, wow, they have a hot hand. Eventually they're going to miss one. Um, and then they'll say, oh, now they suck. That's awful. Really, it's kind of just up to luck. Um, maybe there's like a 95% chance they're going to hit every basket because they're super good. There's a 5% chance they're going to miss it. And so if it they have a long string of baskets. This kind of goes back to the statistical conclusion validity. If there's a 95% chance they're going to make a basket and they shoot 20 times, one of those times, on average, is going to be a miss. Um, and so if we skip one of those times and they're suddenly at like 40 times in a row, that's going to look awesome, but eventually it's going to break again. Um, and so that's this idea of regression to the mean. You see this in programs a lot, especially uh, programs that are designed to intervene when people are um, in poverty or when people are kind of in extreme distress. Um, the Provo School District program that we've been using as an example here, um, the idea there is that it intervenes when students hit a certain level of, of number of absences. And so you're targeting people who are absent the most. And the issue there is you're targeting people in the extreme. And so if you're if you're intervening when somebody is absent like 20 times, um, that they're absent for 20 times either because of something systematic and um, they have no commitment to school, there's issues at home, um, there's something making it so they can't go to school, or it could just be a whole bunch of bad luck. They were sick and eventually they're going to come back and we just happen to catch them at their worst. Um, and so one of the biggest... Um, um, complaints about our program evaluation for the school district program was that we had no way of checking to see if it was just a story of regression to the mean, that we were capturing these kids in this program when they were at their worst. And had we waited maybe two or three weeks, they would have started going back to school naturally just because they were in this sequence of bad luck and now they're back to normal. Um, and being able to disentangle the um, returning back to normal from the effect of the program is hard. Um, so how do you fix that? Um, one way is to, to not look at the super high or the super low performers in a data set. So if you see, if you have some sort of program, like this truancy program, for instance, and somebody's like absent 60 days or something, potentially don't include them in the data set because that's weird. Um, there's something different about them from other people who are absent like 10 times. Um, and so that either there's something systematically like they don't live at that house anymore or there's something that prevents them from coming to school or maybe they just have really, 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 really bad luck. Um, and eventually that luck is going to turn. And so if you kind of omit those like super high performers, super low performers, um, that can kind of address this, this idea of bad luck coming back to normal luck or good luck coming back to normal luck. Um, there's no systematic way of doing that. You just kind of have to justify why you might be omitting some people. Um, don't omit some people and then run a model with some people omitted to see if there's a, a change in, in the effect. Um, justify why you're doing it. You're not just throwing out these outliers because you want to, um, but because there's probably something systematically different about them, um, or maybe there's a regression to the mean issue. And so it's tricky. Um, so a few other issues that we have with internal validity. Um, we have this idea of measurement error. Um, if you measure the outcome incorrectly, then you'll have a bias in the effect. And so the solution here is measure the outcome correctly seems pretty obvious. Um, this is related to the construct validity issue that we've been talking about and that you worked with in your last assignment. Um, other issues, um, you have time frame issues. Um, if the, the period of your study is too short, if you're trying to measure the effect of a program um, and you measure on Monday, uh, a pretest, and then you give a post test on Friday, and the program happened on Wednesday, and it's designed to like boost incomes and skills and stuff through like job training. Um, and then you measure somebody's income two days later, 
there's not going to be an effect. That was not a very long period of time to see any sort of measurable effect. And so you're not going to detect anything in annual incomes if you just check like two days later, which seems really obvious. Um, but you can also go to the extreme. If you have some sort of job training program and you measure somebody's um, income before the program, and then 50 years later, you measure their income after the program, you're not going to see any effect anymore. That's like five decades of time that have passed. Um, whatever effect that program had just kind of got erased by time, um, and it's not going to be detectable anymore. There's also going to be issues with attrition. If you wait 50 years, um, people are going to just, you're going to lose contact with them. People are going to die. People are going to move out of the state, out of the country, and it's going to be impossible to follow up. And so having a time period that's way too long is bad. Having a time period that's way too short is bad. So you need to choose the ideal time period length. And how do you do that? There's no way of knowing. Um, there's no statistical test that tells you how many days you should wait before you do a post-test. Um, the only way to do this is to use your prior knowledge about how the program works and the population that you're doing the program on um, and just kind of use your knowledge of that to choose the right length and good luck with that. Um, a few final issues with validity. There's this idea of the Hawthorne effect. Um, that's named after a factory um, from Chicago, I think, from the 1920s, um, where in the 1920s, that's when um, lights were, um, like electric lights were being kind of rolled out to the world. Um, and so factories at that point were using gas lights and candles and other ways of, of, of lighting the factory floor, um, which were not super bright. And so employees of this factory wanted their um, managers to add electric lights because um, that's brighter, um, less of a strain on people's eyes. It's, it's kind of a safer working environment. And so what happened is um, these managers decided to run some randomized control trials and to see if workers were more efficient when they had the electric lights turned on. Um, and if they were less efficient when they had the electric lights turned off. And so they would come out on the balcony and watch the, the factory floor with the lights on and with the, the gas lights on and see how effective people were. And what happened is these workers, whenever the lights were on and they could see that they were being observed, they would start working really hard um, because they knew they were being observed and they knew that if the study said they worked harder with, gas, with the electric lights on, then they'll probably get the electric lights. Um, and then if they were being observed and they had the gas lights on, they didn't work as hard because they didn't want that outcome. And so as you observe people, um, they'll behave differently. Um, there's a whole bunch of different other studies on this, like people respond to being observed. Um, if you're trying to study somebody, like family interactions, for instance, um, you could bring them into kind of a really sterile looking room with a one-way mirror and they know that there's this team of scientists watching them from one side and then they're going to behave totally differently than they would if they were just like in their living room and you had like a hidden camera observing them or something and they didn't know they were being observed. Their behavior is going to be wildly different. Um, and so um, how do you fix this? How do you make it so your participants and the people you're studying um, don't behave differently. There's no easy way to do this. You could hide, um, but then that gets into ethical issues and you generally don't want to be spying on people. That's bad. Um, you can use completely unobserved control groups, but again, there's um, ethical issues with spying on people without their consent, especially if they're unobserved. Um, so it's just something to be aware of um, that as you're studying people, they'll behave differently because you're studying them. Um, and whatever they do might not reflect what they would actually do if they weren't being observed. So just be aware that that is a thing. Um, the opposite of, or a, a version of this, kind of the opposite of a Hawthorne effect is this idea of the John Henry effect. And this is named after the, the tall tale, the American tall tale of this guy named John Henry, who was super strong um, back in the early 1800s as the railroad was being um, built. Um, and so he was really good at laying track, um, but then the railroad people invented a fancy new machine that could drill through mountains and they could lay track a lot faster than a person. And so he um, challenged the machine to a, a competition um, to say, I am faster than you. Um, and so they had this, this competition to see who could lay the most track and the machine won and John Henry died over, from overexertion. And it's kind of a, a sad story, but 
you know, American tall tale, hooray. Um, but where this gets applied to program evaluation and to research design is that control groups will sometimes work as hard as they can to prove that they're as good as the treatment group. Um, to prove that like they're as strong as these cool machines. Um, and so this, this happens often if the control group knows that there's an experiment happening and they know that there might be some positive outcome. Um, for instance, if you have a program that is designed to reduce class sizes in elementary schools and you want to, to show that smaller class sizes perform better um, and so smaller class sizes should be rolled out, um, you could, if you're doing some sort of study in one school and one next, like one classroom has a small class size because they're the treatment group and the next door classroom is the control group and they have a bigger class, that teacher might see the situation and say, we're just as good as the treatment group. We can do just as well. We can score just as high on the exam. And so they'll work extra hard to kind of prove to the treatment group that they can do it, um, which is great but then it distorts the findings of the results um, because the, the control group is no longer the control. Um, they're kind of acting as the treatment group now, and that's bad for the sake of science. Um, so how do you fix this? You keep the two groups separate and make sure they don't um, interact with each other. Um, what happened with, the, with some school experiments, there's the Tennessee Star experiment that was designed to check to see if smaller class sizes had effects on testing and on grades and on other outcomes. Um, they purposely did not choose small classes, the treatment groups, in the same school as the control groups. They spread it out through different districts, and so the control groups and treatment groups didn't know who each other were, and so you couldn't have the John Henry effect. Um, because the treatment or the control groups were not trying to be as good as the treatment groups. Um, another issue you have is this idea of spillover effects, um, which is kind of like the, the 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 John Henry effect, but instead of purposely trying to be better, um, sometimes a program will just have positive externalities um, and will improve everything that's happening around. Um, so a good example of this um, from the World Bank reading you had was deworming, um, where um, researchers would go around to different villages and deworm people in some villages and not deworm people in other villages. Um, but as the, the worm population started dying because they were getting dewormed, that had a spillover effect to neighboring villages that were kind of the control groups because there were fewer worms and parasites to infect them. And so it kind of spread throughout. And so there were positive spillover effects or positive externalities, if we talk about economics, um, where um, the effect was not isolated to one location and it kind of went to other areas. Um, we also have this with social interaction. Um, if you're trying to do some sort of intervention to um, teach people good behavior or if you're trying to intervene and improve people's mental health um, or something, those people have friends and they'll go talk to their neighbors and their friends and say, I just did this cool program. And then maybe they'll teach them some of the core principles of the program and then that will spill over and then um, more people will learn about your intervention or be affected by the intervention than is what is supposed to be in the treatment group. Um, you can also have equilibrium effects, which is similar to this idea of externalities. If you have some sort of intervention that is designed to improve society, um, the society might be better off as a result. And that means we hit a new equilibrium where society was kind of worse off. There's some sort of program. Now it's better off with Medicaid, for instance. It was designed to reduce poverty and increase employment and um, make it so that people are, are more engaged in the economy. And so if people are doing that, and if there are measurable effects from Medicaid reducing poverty, then the whole economy improves, which then makes it hard to isolate the effect of just Medicaid on kind of the whole economy getting better. So that's this equilibrium effect idea. Um, how to fix it? Um, try to keep the two groups as separate as possible and use really distant control groups. Um, so with deworming, um, don't have a control group that's right next door to the village that's getting the deworming effect because there's going to be spillovers. And so choose a village that's super far away. Um, same thing with social interaction. Like if you're doing some sort of um, social intervention, some sort of teaching program, make it so that the people who get the, get the program 
won't talk to the people in the control group. And if the control group is like right next door, they're going to talk and there's going to be contamination across those two groups. But if you choose a control group that's on a different side of the city or in a completely different city, then that's probably going to be better and you'll have fewer spillover effects. Um, the final issue you have is this idea of intervening events where something will happen to one of the groups and not the other. Um, something out of your control. Um, a global pandemic affects um, people in a country that you're studying and your control group is in a country that handles the pandemic better. Um, a hurricane hits a city. Um, you're trying to study the effects of climate change um, on different communities and a hurricane hits one of the cities that you're studying but doesn't hit the other one. And the one that it hits is your control group or your treatment group and the other one is the opposite. Oh no, um, that totally messes up your treatment and control groups. And so how do you fix that? There's no easy way to fix it. Um, it can just, if, if there's some systematic event that only influences your treatment group or only influences your control group and messes them up, um, then you're not gonna be able to isolate any trends anymore um, because your, your groups have been messed up completely. And so good luck fixing it. There's no easy way to do it. Um, often that's just a lost experiment. Um, so sad times for science. Um, so what we just talked about are all of these different um, types of internal validity here, these general categories, the emitted variable bias, the trend issues, the calibration issues, and the contamination issues. Um, again, these are all kind of tricky things to find in studies. Um, in, in designing your own study, you're gonna bump into these things. They're things that you need to be aware of. Um, for your assignment and for this week, your job is to take some published studies and look at them and see how well they handle selection and attrition and seasonality and John Henry effects and these other things, just to check how valid these things are. Um, there's no right answer to fixing all these things. They're just things that you need to be aware of. Um, there are lots of ways you can fix them. There are lots of ways you can't fix them. Um, easiest way to fix lots of these things is randomization. If you can randomly assign people to treatment and control groups, that fixes selection issues. Um, if you randomly assign people to treatment and control groups, it also fixes regression to the mean um, and maturation and a whole bunch of other issues. But if you randomize people to treatment and control groups, it does nothing to fix attrition. Um, people are going to leave your program um, because of systematic reasons or just because of randomness. Um, good treatment and control groups is not going to fix any of your measurement issues. It's not going to fix contamination issues, especially if treatment and control are right next door. That's going to be messed up. Um, and so randomization is great, but it's not kind of the magic. It's not like a magic wand that will fix everything. Um, and some things you just can't fix. And you just have to hope that it's not an issue and try your hardest to justify why it is an issue or why it isn't an issue. And good luck with that.